So welcome all to the, our third talk in St. Benedict Week. It's great to see everyone here. And my name is Adam Simon. I'm the leader of the lay community of St. Benedict. So I want to give a very, very warm welcome to everybody uh, into this uh, Zoom space, uh, which is a marvelous gift of technology, allowing us all to connect and to share in these wonderful talks. So for those of you who have never come across the lay community of St. Benedict, uh, we are a school of the Lord's service. We are 53 years old. We are lay-led, ecumenical, inclusive and intergenerational. We make three promises to, which are to create, we do this on an annual basis, to create holy space, which is very close to the stability and space of the monastery, to offer holy service, which is our work and offering to the church, and to live holy communion, which is our obedience to each other, our prayer and the joy of community. And so far we've been hearing some really interesting um, insights into obedience in these talks and our hope and dream is to help to create a new generation of fans of saint benedict in the company of other lovers of his way uh, which i believe so many of you tonight um, are lovers of saint benedict we're so pleased to welcome dr scholastica jacob as our speaker tonight very grateful for her coming and I'm now going to pass on to Mike Woodward, who is going to introduce uh, Dr. Scholastica and who is going to host the rest of the evening. So over to you, Mike. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just um, struggling with that. Okay. So it's a great privilege and uh, joy to welcome uh, Scholastica into our midst. I've been um, finding out about a few more connections than I was aware of at the beginning. Um, but one I would like to just stress at the beginning now is that where she's working at St Anthony's Priory as um, archivist and librarian in Durham, the prior is actually Reverend Nick Buxton. Is that right? And um, he was part of that initial uh, Worth Abbey uh, video series uh, where the young men came to the monastery to live alongside the monks and uh, see what they made of them and what, the, and what they made of the monastic life. Um, so he went, went on to uh, become an Anglican uh, uh, priest after that and um, the rest is history. Now, Scholastica, uh, after university, got involved with the legal end of grant making and with a lot of social inclusion and arts projects. And then in 2002, um, she joined the Stanbrook community. And um, uh, the kind of uh, obvious jobs for her perhaps became archivist and librarian and seller. But there's another side to Scholastica and that is borne out by the fact that um, she was noted not only for her scholarship, but also for her pastoral care. So that included the infirmary, uh, but evidently she was also very at home in wellies because she uh, looked after the hens before graduating to taking on some lamb. And Scholastica actually was very soon in charge of a whole flock of sheep. Um, and we can only hope that these were indeed uh, Jacob's sheep. Um, I don't know if they were, but if they were, that would have been very appropriate as they um, they came to Britain, uh, were known in Britain in the 17th century, which is one of the periods that, that Scholastica has kind of, uh, done a lot of research and um, um, very uh, important work in. Now, those of you who were here last night uh, will notice a bit of continuity coming up, but when she... Um, left uh, Stanbrook in 2020, uh, she took on a PhD at Durham University, researching Benedictine religious life, exile and identity and cultural history. 
and that will form the basis for what we're going to hear here this evening. Um, the continuity comes from the fact that that after that, uh, Scholastica's tenure of a Pearl Research Fellowship from the Margaret Beaufort Institute in Cambridge gives us a lovely um, link to uh, Rowan last night. So uh, I was fortunate to meet Scholastica properly because I'd known her from a very big distance at the in the um, uh, community at Sandbrook uh, at a Benedictine history symposium at Dowie Abbey, and um, she gave us a sparkling talk on the various Benedictine continental communities and how they survived the French Revolution and the toll it took on them as they returned to Britain and the many new challenges they faced. And it was so interesting, illuminating, because such uh, a, a kind of take on how um, Stanbrook came to be where it is now and the many transitions and different situations they've had to face was absolutely fascinating. So um, I think some of that will, will, will come into this evening. So um, without more ado, we will um, turn to Scholastica um, and we'll just say uh, a prayer for you, if we may, before we start. So, Father in heaven, we thank you for the ability that you've given us to learn from those who have gone before us. We thank you for their faith. We thank you for all they have passed on to us. And uh, we ask to be worthy of them as our um, forebears. And uh, we ask you to bless Scholastica in all the work that she does, uh, the many responsibilities that she carries. And we pray that you'll bless her this evening with your Holy Spirit and open our hearts and minds to hear the words that she will share. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just, so. just before Scholastica starts, can I just say that when Scholastica is finished, we will open up the chat. And like the last two nights, if you have any questions or observations or whatever, I know Scholastica would like there to be uh, an open discussion after her talk. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Adam, and thank you, Michael, for the introduction, and, and thank you both for inviting me to come and talk to you tonight. Uh, it's such a pleasure. So uh, I will just ask for your um, patience because I'm just recovering from quite a bad cold, so I'm going to be a tiny bit croaky. So if I have to stop and grab a drink, um, please bear with me. But... Um, it was such a delight to be approached by Michael, totally out of the blue, uh, a few weeks ago, and and to be invited to participate in this um, in this Benedict week. And I was so particularly excited and moved by the subject Saint Benedict in the time in in a time of crisis, and it made me obviously think about. Benedictine history throughout the centuries, but most specifically about the work that I'd done on the, um, the Benedictine communities, the English Benedictine communities, and explored the real crisis that they experienced in the French Revolution and then in the years following the French Revolution, uh, which eventually led to them returning to England. And the ongoing crisis that, that that created. So what I'd like to do this evening is just to talk about that, give you a background to the history, um, uh, but try and tease out why it was a crisis and how the rule of St. Benedict and faith in their life and the stability and the commitment to their life actually helped them through the various different um, the different stages of, of real crisis and emergency that they that they experienced and I might end just by um, drawing out a few areas where I think although this is obviously something that happened you know several hundred years ago there's still a lot of lessons that we as lay Benedictines as people who are just interested in the rule can actually learn from them and possibly take on to help us in, in situations that we find ourselves. So 
I hope it'll be a bit of history, but also the opportunity maybe for a bit of a bit of reflection on how we can how we can respond to to the the lessons that those nuns learned all those years ago. So just really to give a bit of background, uh, and I might just start off by telling you that this is largely based on the research that I did for my doctorate, but I'm not going to give a long learned academic um, discourse on the on the doctorate because uh, I don't think that would be particularly interesting tonight. But my subject was <clears throat> from exile to exile repatriation, resettlement, and the contemplative experience of English Benedictine nuns in England from 1795 to 1838. And I think what really struck me when I started to think and read and explore the archives of the communities was that the traditional narrative is that after the dissolution in England, the dissolution of the monasteries, all the um, all the communities, especially you know the Benedictines, were all closed down, and the monks obviously opened monasteries on the continent at St Gregory's, at Douai, in Paris, and the nuns did the same thing. So um, over the next hundred years, five communities of Benedictine English Benedictine nuns were founded on the continent, um, and all those five continued to be with us until almost until the present day. Um, Stanbrook Abbey is the only real survivor now, but the community at Colwich still have some members who are also part, part of the, uh, the congregation. So there was a real intent, and it was a response to a crisis, the crisis of the, the, the dissolution, really, that the first English... Benedictine convents were founded on the continent. And I think for, um, for young women setting out in 1623, 1625, uh, and in fact, the very first one was 1598, it was such an incredibly courageous thing for them to do. Most of them were in their late teens and they kind of set sail from England, never expecting to see England again, but feeling that their, their desire to serve God in a vocation, uh, following the rule of St. Benedict, drew them to, um, to make this huge sacrifice. And a lot of them came from families of martyrs, or they had connections with martyrs, and it was their way of giving their life. For most of them, it was obviously a white martyrdom, it was the martyrdom of of um, obedience, of following following the law in a religious community. Uh, but it was a huge, it was a huge gift. It was a huge um, offering to make. And so um, when the communities were founded, there were five communities, all Benedictine women. Uh, the first one was founded in Brussels in 1598. The second in Combray in 1623. The third in Kent in 1624, then Paris in 1651, and Dunkirk in 1662. And they were all founded as English houses following the rule of St. Benedict. And the intention was to preserve English Benedictine life on the continent for English women up until such a time that it could be returned to England. So they were very clear that they were only houses of English women and they wanted to preserve this particular form of English Benedictine life. So over the next 200 odd years, they didn't really take any non-English, um, Welsh or some Irish members. Um, and this wasn't because they were being at all exclusive, but it was a real commitment to ensuring that the life was continued and with the aim of never returning to England until Catholicism had been restored in all its glory and religious life could be refounded in, in the country that they all came from. So they lived quite happily on the continent and they built um, you know, fairly big mon monasteries uh, and they attracted quite a lot of vocations. They had various ups and downs, but 
I think on the whole, things were going quite smoothly and there weren't any more crises than the the kind of inevitable crisis that happens in, in community life, as, as I'm sure most people will know, uh, until 1789. And 1789, of course, was the outbreak of the French Revolution. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware of the anti-clerical laws that were brought in by the revolutionaries. The English communities actually were largely exempt from them. So although uh, the French Revolution is um, dissolved the French monasteries and those in, in French related uh, territories, the English survived and they were allowed to keep going. But we have various accounts of the fear that they felt the sense of isolation, they could no longer have any contact with family back in England, there was no scope for new vocations coming over from England, the, the channel was sort of cut off. And increasingly, they suffered from um, poverty, from a real sense of dread of what was going to happen next. And they could see convents near to them, French convents of of nuns being dragged out into the street, being, you know, having a abuse hurled at them and so forth. So some letters have survived from that time, which um, I'd really like to publish, actually, because I, I've used some of them for talks and things in the past. And they're a wonderful combination of um, just mundanity, people writing back to their families saying, how's little cousin Betsy? And then... Um, Oh, and we had a we had an invasion of uh, rioters last week, and they took all our bread, and we're left with nothing, and we don't know what's going to happen. So it's actually a wonderful kind of Benedictine um, laid backness about that. Oh yes, and by the way, um, you know we we aren't able to we're now not able to get a priest to celebrate mass, but we still continue to be faithful to the the divine office, and it, it is a sort of. Um, it's a wonderful example of actually just just carrying on being faithful to the rule. And as I say, they are they are really um, they're really insightful letters. So I think I think they do deserve a wider audience at some stage. Uh, 1793 was the real crunch point, because at that moment, the um, England joined the war with the Allies against France. So at that point, all the English religious who were still living on the continent were enemy aliens. And that was when, um, you know, the crisis really, really hit rock bottom. So all five of the English Benedictine nuns um, immediately had to flee. And the communities at Brussels and Ghent, partly because they weren't actually immediately in France, they were a bit further away from from the revolutionary forces, they were both able to flee to England. And although they left most of their belongings behind, they were actually able to escape with their lives. For the other three communities, Combray, Paris and Dunkirk, things were, were more, um, more desperate. Um, all of the communities have left accounts of their experience during this period. So we have, um, for example, if I can just find them, the um, the nuns from Ghent, before they escaped the city, described how they could view the battle from the windows as the French advanced into the city. And uh, one, one nar narrator wrote, cannonballs flew over their roof and landed, and one landed in the garden, narrowly missing the portress. So again, there's no, there's no kind of, we were absolutely terrified. It's just, oh yeah, you know, um, one cannonball just missed the portraits. <laughs> For the, nun, the nun, Dunkirk nuns also experienced fighting right outside their church and shots actually penetrated the windows of the church. They witnessed the siege of Dunkirk, at which point their monastery was occupied, their property sequestered, and the community was all arrested and taken to prison by canal. And during this journey, they overheard their captors discussing whether to actually sink the barge they were on to be saved all further trouble of having to, you know, to sort of take these nuns into custody. Uh, 
for the nuns from Combray, um, who later became the community at Standbrook, the experience was also very traumatic. They were arrested, they were traveled, they, they traveled in open carts across quite a lot of northern France. And um, they were eventually thrown into prison, just what, what one of the commentators describes as a common jail. And um, they were there for 18 months. Uh, and a wonderful account, which we have published by one of the survivors of that experience, Dame Anne Theresa Partington, um, gives a really graphic description of the whole experience. But again, it's very kind of, it's very measured, it's very balanced, it's very reasonable. Uh, although she was clearly very traumatized by it, she writes at the beginning, it is three years since these scenes of horror happened, yet the writer of this declares that her blood chills whenever she thinks of that dreadful day. And I think in her account, it's quite clear that for all, all the community, it was their faith and their religious identity that sustained them. Um, for example, they hung on to wearing the religious habit for as long as they possibly could because it was a real sense of identity of who they were. Um, and they were actually very much mocked and abused for that. So when they were being transported in open carts across France, um, Dame Anne Theresa says, for nuns to appear in the religious dress was at that time the worst of crimes. Some of the crowd talked of tearing them to pieces. Others said they would bury them alive with their prescribed dress. And she very much describes the witness of the habit as being a defiant act, but one that actually earned some respect as well as humiliation. And she goes on, gratitude to a merciful providence over us in all our distress prompts me to remark here that the mob said everything shocking and surrounded us on every side as if to tear us into a thousand pieces. And on one occasion, one cut off a piece of one of our veils. Yet not one of them laid a hand upon our bodies. And in every place, some were found who shed tears of compassion over us. Um, the nuns also contrived to keep some precious religious objects with them, although they were strip searched on occasions. And when these objects were discovered, their jailers proceeded to um, unpin their gowns, search them under their veils, in their hair. And if they found a crucifix or a reliquary, uh, if it was of any value of gold or silver, uh, they took it and kept it for themselves. If it was a baser metal, they broke it and sometimes gave the bits back to the owner. Uh, these were very traumatic and very hard times. They were suffering from starvation. Four members of that particular community died in prison. Uh, they were, some of them were quite elderly. Their chaplain who, who was with them also died in prison and a number of others were very sick. Uh, and similar things happened to the Dunkirk and the Paris nuns. They both also lost members who died in prison. So it was no, way uh, an easy experience <laughs> and uh, for the Combray nuns they were in prison in Compiègne and I'm sure you're familiar with the story of the Compiègne martyrs the Carmelite martyrs from from Compiègne uh, they were actually imprisoned with the with the Combray nuns and although they didn't have much contact to, with each other they were aware of each other's presence and I think greatly supported by the fact that there was there were other religious in this in this dark dungeon with them and when the um carmelites were finally taken to paris to the guillotine the clothes that they'd been wearing which were actually happened to be in the wash at the time uh were subsequently given to the benedictines because uh as as dame theresa Anne says the um the prison authorities believed that we were going to be next to be taken to the guillotine in paris and they didn't want us to go in our par in our habits because of the the obvious witness that that would provide. 
So they made us wear these old peasant clothes that had been left behind by the Carmelites. And it was only when the, um, when the Benedictines later discovered that the Carmelites had been martyred that they realised the huge value of the what they considered to be old rags that they'd had to wear. And they actually wore the, these clothes all the way back when they finally came back to England. And they were, um, they're now considered relics and they are actually in a reliquary in, the, in Stanbrook Abbey. Um, when the cause for the, the Carmelites was, was heard, it was held, part of it was held at Stanbrook Abbey. So it's a very, very precious witness. And I think it's, a, uh, it's, it's made a special bond between the, the Benedictines and Carmelites uh, everywhere, actually, which is, which is um, a great example of, of different orders working together and, and sharing their suffering together. So just to move on swiftly, after 18 months, Robespierre was defeated. Um, the Combray nuns certainly missed the guillotine by a matter of weeks, luckily due to his fall. But all the communities had to stay in um, France for another six months or so because they just couldn't get back to England. So they realised that the immediate crisis of their um, imprisonment and the threat of death was was passing but they knew from um from reports they'd heard that none of their monasteries had survived they'd all been uh taken over by rioters all the property had either been looted or destroyed and there was no way they could go back to to the convents that they'd built that they'd inhabited for for nearly 200 years so in desperation they realized that the only thing to do was to go back to England where they had at least had some friends and family. But this, um, as I, I tried to explore in my thesis, was actually not, and this was an exile as much as the first exile was. They didn't go back willingly at this time. They never expected to return to England until, um, until Catholicism had been restored in that country. And it clearly wasn't. In 1795, there'd been some relief acts which had eased some of the penal laws against, against Catholics, but it was by no means um, lifted. And as you know, emancipation didn't happen until 1829. So they scraped together enough money to get back to England and they came back by degrees um, to, to absolute penury. I mean, the the there's so many similarities. We hear such awful refugee stories today. The nuns were in such a similar position. They came as refugees, they came penniless, and they came as, um, as persecuted by and for their religion to a country where their religion wasn't accepted either. So um, it was an incredibly, it was an incredibly difficult time for them. Uh, again, we have um, narrators who talk about the experience and we've got some wonderful accounts in the annals of the crisis that they experienced in England when they arrived and the challenges that were faced uh, by all the communities in, in attempting to rebuild their lives in England. Um, so when they actually arrived in England we've got an account that says uh, the nuns expressed the humiliation of arriving as refugees in their native land and they described their appearance as ludicrous in the extreme. We were clothed in garments of various shapes, textures and hue, bed, bed curtains forming the principal features in the material of which they were made. And they concluded, um, no marvel was it that the servants smiled. And of course, nuns hadn't been seen in England for, you know, for several hundred years. And there was a there was a huge curiosity about them, but there was also still quite a prejudice. And there's a story which I think is almost certainly apocryphal, uh, but it's told regularly that some servants who were dispatched to meet one of the communities in Dover, where they landed, uh, were having a discussion, and they said, "You know, we're supposed to be picking up these nuns. What are nuns?" And uh, one of the other servants said, uh, "I think it's some kind of potato that's coming from the continent." <laughs> So um, there was really a lack of, a lack of, um, well, there's either prejudice or there was a real lack of understanding of religious life. 
and for um for many of the women it was we are returning to england we're english women but we're also catholic women and there was a huge clash of identity for all of them while they identified as as english they also identified as being Catholic and they just didn't see how the two could be reconciled in England at that time. So for the first few years, the kind of crisis they were experiencing on one level, the need to live, to find somewhere to live, to find some way to make a living, to sustain their, their monastic life, such as it could be. Uh, on another level, they were actually looking to get back to the continent to Catholic Europe to find a home there where they felt they could continue to preserve preserve the life. Um, many challenges were experienced in those early years in England. Um, they were totally dependent on benefactors, and there were many generous benefactors who who supported them. But they were also, while there was an outpouring of sympathy for them at the very beginning. This quite quickly turned um, to resentment and it turned to there were various riots against the opening of convents in certain places in England. So they were very, very frightened, actually, that what they'd experienced in France might potentially happen to them when they arrived in England. Um, poverty was great. The the third, I think the third crisis, so the first, if the first crisis was the dissolution of the monasteries and the founding of Benedictine houses abroad, Benedict helped them in, in that time of crisis, it, the rule and their faith very much supported them during the French Revolution and the period in prison. But then the third crisis, where they really had to draw on all their resources um, of faith, was in the years, the early years back in England, they experienced poverty, they experienced living in very inadequate buildings where there was no way they could restore enclosure, it was very difficult to continue um, any kind of liturgical life, even to have a chapel that they, they could say the hours in was, was very difficult. Um, they experienced political and social prejudice in the areas that they moved into. Most of the communities, uh, and they really kind of brush over this, but the age profile was high because there had been very few entrants in the last years on the continent. So they were elderly. There was a lot of sickness. And most of them must have been very traumatised by the experience. And there are descriptions of some of the community as being um, yeah, although she was only 40, she was like an old woman. She was, you know, she had a permanent tremor because of the experiences she'd been through. Uh, and I'm sure that today we diagnose it as being some kind of post, um, post-traumatic post syndrome that they experienced, but there was no recognition of that. It was kind of this expectation that you would carry on and rebuild your life. Or also a serious lack of vacations. Uh, so I think the crisis that they felt they were facing was how are are we going to survive? You know, even if we can physically survive, are we going to get new members? How are we going to to continue our formation to to fulfill our, our Benedictine life? And when vocations did come, there was a real generation divide in terms of experience, education, cultural background, um, which takes quite a lot of unpacking, but but it was experienced in all the communities. The three areas that were perhaps most difficult for them that went to the heart of their Benedictine life was the loss of the habit, because it was illegal to wear the habit in England at that time, the loss of an enclosure of any sort. Uh, most of them were living in little townhouses um, and it was illegal to have an enclosure wall or anything like that, even if they even if they could have devised one. And uh, as I said before, the actual space to celebrate the divine office, which of course is at the heart of Benedictine life as well. So I think um, really the the way they responded was to go back to to the roots of the rule. What were the essential traits of Benedictine life that they held in common? 
and how they assessed what was absolutely negotiable, what they could let go, at least for the time being, and what was unnegotiable and what they needed to, to keep hold of that would actually feed them and sustain them and help them rebuild their lives. And the essential traits that come out from, from their actual lived experience were obviously the vows. They stayed very, very faithful to the vows, uh, particularly stability. And they had a, a great crisis about the barrel of stability was, um, could they actually make that vow when they felt so unstable? And as we know, the vow of stability isn't just to a geographical place, but that's something very important in Benedictine life. And they, I think they just felt there was so much instability that the spiritual and metaphysical sense of stability was even more important for them at that time. And of course, obedience, that they were, they were trying to be obedient to the rule and to God's will. And that involved endless conversatio in, in all kinds of different ways. Um, the Benedictine tripod of work, prayer and lectio formed the basis of their life, of their experience. Um, and work was very different on the, on the continent. They were obviously contemplative, they were enclosed. They, their work was largely prayer and the normal housekeeping within a, a monastery. Here they were uh, having to run schools of a very different nature from the, the monastic schools that they, you know, they had in the con on the continent. They had to take in borders. They had to uh, do a lot of very rough work themselves that, that, that maybe they, they just weren't fit to do at this stage because they were so debilitated by their experience and that formed a, a large part of their life but it was never at the expense of prayer maybe they were having to pray in different ways in different forms but it comes across so clearly from from the writings that prayer was still central and so was Lexio Divina and their reading and their study uh, and it's quite amazing to look at they all you know being good benedictines they all started collecting libraries again as soon as they had somewhere to keep books and we've got book lists dating from the 1820s they collected a phenomenal amount of books and they were reading and they were starting to translate and transcribe works so in some of the commonplaces you can see commonplace books you can see how um, their reading in informed, they use their reading and their copying out of texts as a way of sustaining their lives and sustaining their, their spiritual life, which is going back to the very early days on the continent when they had a scriptorium and they were writing and copying and preserving texts. And it's amazing how quickly they, they went back to doing that. Again, everything was a battle to try and keep the centrality of prayer, not only in their, their silent prayer, but in choir as well, and um, rebuilding the choirs, making sure that they were in a place that they could have access to, but they weren't, um, they weren't infringing any local laws against, um, against classic Catholic worship in public. Uh, that was central, so much of their concentration of their power went on that. And again, the enclosure, even if it was really simple, um, the kitchen door must always be kept closed. It was inevitable that visitors and guests were going to come in, but you keep the kitchen door closed and the nuns won't go out through that. And it's a symbolic enclosure. And for a long time, the enclosure was symbolic, but it was, it was just that sense of we need to build up ourselves and our own resources within some kind of, if not physical enclosure, then it's just this patch of garden, which is our enclosure, which is our, 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 pray, our prayerful space, our special space. And in all this, it was getting the balance right. So, uh, you know, as, as we know, the rule of St. Benedict is all about balance, really. And they were able to go back to the essentials in the rule and yet adapt them to the circumstances that they were living in. Um, 
And I, I mean, it's it's kind of a bit of a, a, a trivial story, really, but they weren't obviously weren't allowed to wear their habits. Some of them did wear their habits inside, but it was actually um, it was actually something they had a great crisis of conscience about whether they should wear the habit and when they could regain full monastic habit. But there's a story that you know several of the nuns actually wore their old habits under their secular clothes, or they wore a you know a kind of um, reduced wimple or something that they wear under a bigger collar. So it was again it was a symbolism of that identity with that um, with that habit. So I think I probably have need to draw this to a close. I've given you a, an overview of, of what happened, of the history. And I think the, the periods of crisis that were experienced, and I hope a sense of maybe how, how St. Benedict sustained them and the rules sustained them in dealing with these. Um, but it strikes me that the areas that I've talked about that were areas of crisis for the nuns at that time are not dissimilar to some of the experiences that we have today as, as Christians, as um, people in the world trying to follow the, the rule of St. Benedict. Um, poverty is real. We can see poverty all around us in so many different situations in society. Uh, and many of us experience that ourselves. The kind of political and social prejudice that the nuns experienced we're perhaps experiencing in the power of secularization today and the there is a there is a sort of anti-religious movement in a lot of a lot of postmodern society i think for for religious communities and maybe for parish churches as well there's a lack of entrance there's a lack of of people coming you know attend mass attendance is falling membership of um of some religious groups is falling and it's the tension of being able to welcome people from different backgrounds and experiences, which the continental nuns very much encountered when they were having new entrants from very different English backgrounds. Um, again, unsuitable premises, often for religious communities today, it's trying to maintain huge buildings, which are too expensive and, and much too large or maybe adapting to downsizing and, and the difficulties that are experienced there. And enclosure can still be a problem in our own personal life. I, I personally find that in my external challenges in terms of use of social media and the, the kind of pressures that you get from so many different forms of social media today can be can invade one in ways that uh, you need a very different kind of enclosure to to resist and to monitor. So um, I think I'll stop there, and I hope I hope that's given you an overview of of the history, but then also of how I think it can still speak to us today. But I'd really like to you know to hear your comments and maybe have a discussion about this. So thank you. Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Jessica. Such a fascinating talk. Um, you don't associate the enclosure with so much uh, post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome that, that those nuns obviously obviously went through. I, do, I see John's got his hand up, but I've just got one thing to ask you. I think it would be quite illuminating. How, how small could those um, post-exile communities get and still be viable? They, <clears throat> I think the smallest, when they arrived, uh, I've actually got some figures here and I, I'm not sure that I've got them immediately to hand, but there were maybe, I think when men, most of them came back to England, they were around 10 was perhaps the smallest, 15, 16, 17, one of the, the larger ones, but they did fall quite a lot after that. And particularly the community from Paris, who went to Cannington and ultimately Polwich fell very low indeed, uh, probably under 10. And there was a real sense that was it sustainable and really interesting, the, the thing that helped them revive, they had a very, a very dynamic abbots, but also they introduced the practice of perpetual adoration, which is quite an unusual Benedictine devotion. It, it certainly wasn't practiced on the continent, mm -hmm. but this brought 
in the mid 19th century, this suddenly brought vocations flooding in. Uh, so I don't mm. think they ever thought they were not quite sustainable, but um, they certainly got into single figures, which was unheard of from the from the continental days. John Woodhouse, you've had your hand up, please. Uh, would you like to ask a question? Just good ask. Yes, it's just that um, I we recently went to Sacred Heart School in Hammersmith and bought this book. Um, and it describes the Dunkirk Benedictines coming to Hammersmith from 1795 until 1869. And I just wanted to knew about this because there's a lot of detail here. At one point, actually, the nuns were running a school and the bishop was so unimpressed that he gave them a sack. Um, and eventually they moved away from, um, from Hammersmith. We do, and I think um, I I think I have I have I have it actually. It is it is written by uh, it was written about nineteen fifty I think, but it's a wonderful history of of the community. And as you say, they did they were at Hammersmith for many years, and it was actually the, it was actually one of the Mary Ward convents that they took over in in seventeen ninety five. And um, they, as, they, as you say, they ran a school, but it was not at all successful. They were, for, for various reasons, they weren't able to maintain the kind of education of the sort of children that the bishop wanted them to educate. Uh, and they eventually gave it up for, for various reasons, or they were encouraged to give it up. And they went, then went to Tynmouth, and it was there that they, um, they also took on the devotion of perpetual adoration for many years. And um, they felt it was such a wonderful opportunity to get back to being able to live some kind of contemplative life, which they hadn't been able to do in Hammersmith. That was a, a real conflict for them. But yeah, I do know the book, thank you. And it's it's a really good read, actually. <laughs> I'm glad it's still around. I'm still glad it's still available. <laughs> yeah, and uh, as a question from, from Adam, Thank you very much. Thank you for your most enlightening and very moving talk about the history of the nuns. It's it's incredible to hear their history. And I was particularly interested when you said that Lexio was such an important part of one of their disciplines, um, with the prayer community life work and the Lexio. Um, and so I just wondered was there a continuous tradition that sort of went right the way through to Stanbrook of a particular way of doing Lexio? Is there anything that you have come across in what you have read about the Lexio that we can learn from? Obviously, it helped them through the crisis. And I just wonder if there's anything that, you know, was particularly helpful that you saw in your research. I think no, no, thank you. That's that's a really interesting question. And I think it's one that I'd probably like to explore a bit more because from you know, there's this sort of seam of of engagement with Lexio going all the way through from from foundation in the 17th century. And of course the community um, at Combray who who ended up in Stanbrook were formed by Augustine Baker and his approach to Lexio, which was read, you know, let, let the Holy Spirit be your guide, but read whatever is helpful, I think, is, is one way of sort of interpreting what he said. And there's always been a huge openness to um, listening to how the Spirit speaks to you through your particular reading. Um, and I think what the, what the community started making a particular uh, habit of doing was not just reading but writing either writing about it so when they read something that was um that spoke to them was actually to to copy it out or to write their own meditations just for themselves it was never really intended to be something that was shared um so in the 17th century you've got people like dame barbara constable who wrote her own meditations on um sort of stream of consciousness really but it's a totally amazing text 
And it's quite clear that and it's not just the, um, the Stanbrook nuns, the other Benedictine communities were doing a very similar thing. They were reading um, and then they were copying and they were writing and you could sense that the, the engaging with the text as uh, through translation maybe to make it available for, for maybe other members of the community that didn't read in French or Latin or whatever it was. But first and foremost, it was an aid for themselves to to go more slowly and more deeply into a text. Um, and I certainly find myself, you know, if you write something else, something out, you think about it, you go over it again more slowly. And that, I think, is there, has always been their approach to Lexio. And that's why you find there are so many in the archive collections, there's so many manuscripts of um, pieces of, of, of spiritual writing, uh, possibly sometimes of scripture, but it's mostly engagement with devotionals and spiritual books that that have clearly meant a lot to them. And that process of chewing over the text slowly, repeating a single word, is so often committed to writing. Um, and yeah, that shines through actually, and that's what's so exciting about the survival of actual books and, and manuscripts that reveal that really strongly. And I say that's not just the Combray Stanbrook community, that's that's present in all the communities and in their archives. Thank you very much. Is it right, Scholastica, that that um most of what they called Lexio Divina would not be with scripture? Yes, it is. I mean, there's a in, in more recent years, there's been a, a kind of emphasis to go back to see it as scripture and probably that was what benedict himself intended uh i think there's you know there's, there's views on that but certainly for for the nuns throughout this period it scripture was was central to the prayer it was central to the liturgy but i'm not finding so much evidence of them writing and pondering the psalms yet yeah, i think the psalms were often taken as lexio but it was very much additional spiritual writing, particularly the Counter-Reformation Counter authors. But then there was also a return to the Patristic, fa Patristic Fathers. So uh, in the early 19th century, they were really going back to, to the Fathers, to Augustine, mm. to, to some of the more obscure ones, to Chrysostom. Uh, and again, they started translating and copying them out because they didn't have them available or they had one copy. Mm. Um, so no, scripture was clearly, I sometimes think it was just taken for granted that scripture was part of your lexio. So you didn't even bother to comment on that, but it was other stuff that they read that they wanted to share that they, they were fed by. Hmm. Yeah. And any more, any more questions? The chat is switched on if anyone wants to yeah. ask a question through the chat. Uh, or put your hand up as well if you just want to to do that. Can I just ask you one thing, as Glastica? And um, how how many copies of the scriptures would one of these communities have? That's actually also a very interesting question because one of the things I was struck by was I mean all I've really been able to base my research on is library lists that have survived. And all five of the communities have got catalogues of their libraries um, from, from sort of the early 19th century. Uh, very, very few Bibles are listed, but I think that's because every nun would have had her own copy in her cell. So they weren't kept, there are a few, you know, random copies of the, the Douay version or whatever, but mostly it was, um, yeah, the, the Bible was something that they had beside them, so it wasn't kept in the library. I think one has to make that assumption. It's the same with um, liturgical texts. There were no choir mm. or very few choir books in the libraries because presumably they were kept in, in choir and they weren't listed as library books. They mm. certainly didn't have many versions of the, of the Bible, but they would... Um, I think they would probably most of them would have had their own copy. Mm. Thank you. We got a lovely question from our old friend Sister Borberger. Um, thank you for your talk. You really brought the nuns' their experiences to life in terms of their suffering. 
Uh, can you say more about how the communities grappled with the generational and culture gap of new entrants? That is very interesting. Uh, particularly, there was quite a long period when, for all the communities, when they got back to England, no, there were no entrants whatsoever, and that was partly because the communities weren't able to receive them, and um, the, the women just weren't available. When they did start coming later, there was quite a big gap in terms of years between the old survivors and the new the new entrants. And the community that they were living in was very different, but the older members would be looking back to how it was done in Combray, for example, and you know these were Combray ways, and they were quite um, quite disturbed by the lack of formation and discipline that they were able to give to new entrants, um, and the new entrants, on the other hand, were kind of had a bit of a sense of, well, we were never in Combray, we're living, we've entered here, we're living a life here, and we can't go back to how it was in Combray or Dunkirk or Paris or wherever. Um, and there was this sense of a growing divide that the older members of the community, the survivors from the continent, were not really able to give the formation that they'd received themselves and the life that new entrants were coming into was nothing like the, the life as it had been on the continent for them. And mm. they felt a bit at a loss of how to provide the formation that these, these new women needed. And the women were perhaps not always that open to receiving it. They kind of thought they, had, they knew their own ways of mm. how monastic life had to be lived in that era. Mm. So there's some very interesting... Um, discussions in in uh chapter books and things about this growing division mm. and the move away from tradition or what what is actually seen by newer entrants as being tradition mm. in in juxtaposition with the the Combray or the Dunkirk tradition um and some of the younger ones would get heartily sick of being told oh well when we were at Combray yes. we did it like yes. this yeah. And there's a kind of, there's a, a wonderful mantra, somebody's, somebody's written up this account and said, the young ones can be heard murmuring, and of course murmuring is a great yeah. Benedictine sin, murmuring, yeah. um, oh, Combray, Combray, thank goodness for us, we were never there. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, we just, <laughs> we're here and we, we, we need to, um, yeah. we need to move on from what it was like in Combray. Yeah. Fascinating. I think it was a hard, I think it was a very hard time for, for all yeah. of them. There's a good question here from Alan. In the light of the experience of these five communities, can a community call itself Benedictine unless it aspires to enclosure? Well, that's a really interesting collection and uh, question. And of course, how do you define enclosure for the nuns at that time, it was strict papal enclosure as laid down by the Council of Trent. But the monks never lived that sort of enclosure. So there was, you know, I mean, as you know, the monks were mis mostly mission priests at the time. So they came and went from the continent. And while they had an enclosure in their monasteries, they were much freer to come and go from it. So maybe people didn't come into their inner enclosure but they certainly went out from their enclosure. So there was a big difference between Benedictine men and Benedictine women. And I think since, certainly since, um, since Vatican II and the, the ending of that papal enclosure, mo most communities now are aspiring to a sort of constitutional enclosure, which can be much more flexible and used to adapt to the, um, you know the needs of the time and there are certainly all kinds of there's a whole spectrum of enclosure that exists today in benedictine communities mm. i don't think it's i think you could be benedictine without being strictly enclosed but i think you need to have some kind of enclosure whether it's physical or mm. or spiritual you need to mm. be aware of of a sense of enclosure and i think most most benedictines are yeah, there's a lovely essay entitled in, in the, the, uh, the Portable Cloister of the Heart, and mm. I guess that 
Mm, that's mm. one way of doing it. Yeah. Wow. Thank and you. Thank you. So I can see one, one, somebody's got their hand up there. I think it might right. be Angie. <laughs> yeah, it is, yes. Go ahead. I can't see it. Go ahead, Anne. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, Scholastica, it's lovely to see you again. Um, Hi. Um, last time, of course, being at Stanbrook. Um, and you might not be surprised that I might ask a musical question. Um, obviously, you know, the, the life of the nuns, the prayer of the nuns is based around the, the psalms for the offices, which of course are sung. Um, were the nuns able, you know, that far back to, to keep that um, tradition going? throughout the, the problems that they had, were they, be, were they able to, to keep the monastic chant? It's, it's, that's extremely interesting because, and in fact, I, I was talking about this earlier today, um, the, the way the, um, the celebration of the monastic office changed on the continent, and it, you, you're probably aware of this, Angie, there was a great movement in the, the towards the middle of the 18th century towards polyphony and towards much more um much more flamboyant operatic recital of the liturgy um which was happening in all the communities on the continent uh often inspired by the um the kind of the the royal chapels um and when the communities came back to england they weren't trying to sing plain chant they tr weren't trying to reintroduce the um the monastic chant like that they were trying to go back to this polyph polyphony uh sort of figured figured music and they were trying to do um almost operatic masses you know they were trying to uh sing mozart masses haydn mm -hmm. and it was com completely beyond their their ability uh, a lot of the books had um a book by uh, I think it's Vincent Novello, Sacred Music for Masses, which is, you know, three or four parts um, mm. and very, very demanding. And they, they valued more than anything else one of the members of the, um, the Salford community. What they valued was that she'd been trained in music by Italian masters and she could sing mm. all the um, soprano pieces from Mozart's Masses. Mm. So that was incredibly challenging. It was wonderful if they had someone that could do that. And it wasn't really until, um, well, until the Salem um, congregation rose and did the, the revival of monastic plain chant. And that then influenced uh, people like Lawrence Shepherd, and it came back to England. And of course, Stanbrook then led the way in, in the revival of plain chant. But they were struggling until until about the 1870s to try and reintroduce this very elaborate form of, of, of singing the office. And mostly they didn't. I think a lot of it was recto tono. They were doing it in a um, and perhaps having to say a lot more than than mm. they did. Uh, so for quite a long time, actually. But they once they rediscovered plain chant, I think mm. I think they really did then then managed to reproduce a, a much more prayerful and, and truly monastic uh, office. Mm. Wow, fascinating. Thank you. We've covered so much ground and, and so many sides to the subject. Thank you so much, Scholastica, for, for leading the way and um, uh, shedding so much light on something we know very little about. It's, uh, fascinating. And uh, God bless your research in the future. We look Thank forward you. to more fruit from it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to share this because I, I'm just so passionate about the history and I think it's so fascinating. So it's wonderful to for you to be so interested. So thank you. Great, great. But well, we hope to see you again before too long. Be I'd love to, definitely. Yeah. Yes, please. So thank you very much. <laughs> Can thank I you. add my thanks, please, uh, Scholastica from the community? It's been wonderful to have you here. Uh, really enlightening, as I said, very moving to hear this history. It's really quite an eye-opening history that you've shared with us and one that I think we should be cherished and be proud of. So thank you very much indeed. I'd just like to do a little plug for uh, two things. One is that the last talk is going to be by Father Chad Bolton from Ampleforth Abbey, who's talking at 11 o'clock on YouTube, but you can do catch up on that. It's part of the Ampleforth 
Saturday uh, reflections, but he's going to be doing St. Benedict week for us. So do uh, enjoy that. And also, there's a few of us going to Dowie Abbey tomorrow. If anyone is free, please email us. We're going to visit the EBC archives, have a cup of tea with the monks, and we're going to join them in solemn vespers for the Feast of St. Benedict. I'm sure you'd love to come, Scholastico. I was going to say, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds brilliant. I'll be with you in spirit. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think it would definitely be, you'd love it, yeah. So thank you. God bless everyone. Thank you for joining us thank tonight. You. Thank yes, you. Thank you so much. <laughs>